<laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I know it's been a long day of talks, so I appreciate you making it to the 431. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how to build an AI-powered pet detector, specifically inside of Visual Studio Code. So we're going to be using a few different technologies in addition to Visual Studio Code, like TensorFlow, Python, of course, and Azure Machine Learning. Um, and you already got a bit of an introduction, but just to reintroduce myself, so I'm a program manager at Microsoft working specifically on AI tooling for Python. So if you've ever had an experience with Python and Microsoft that has made you sad, let me know and I'll try to fix it. Um, and there's my Twitter and my email. All my coworkers have more followers than me, so if you want to do me a favor, hit me up. <laughs> I'll show this at the end as well. Um, so. Today, we're going to be talking about how we classify dogs and cats. So as humans, we've learned throughout our years what a golden retriever looks like versus a pug. But for machines, we have to try to teach them that. And it might be easy with some examples like that. A pug and a golden retriever, they look completely different. But for instance, a Malamute and a Siberian Husky or a Whippet and a Greyhound, they can look pretty similar. So, We'll have to see how accurate we can get this model to be able to distinguish between these similar types of breeds. And to do this, we're going to be using a technique called deep learning. And at a high level, you could kind of think about deep learning as this black box. And we know the inputs. We know we're going to give it this picture. This is my dog, Mowgli. He's cute. Uh, and we'll get back out some outputs, so some predictions about in this example, it's dog or cat or something else, but uh, the model we're building will actually be saying breeds. He's a mutt, so it wouldn't work well for him, but in theory. Um, so this uh, differs a bit, this sort of black box approach differs a bit than traditional machi machine learning you might have seen, where we can better understand the exact features that are playing a role in our model. So for instance, if you're doing traditional machine learning and you're trying to create a model for popular travel destinations. You might think an important feature there could be climate or temperature in those locations. But with deep learning, you don't have as much of that knowledge. And there's a ton of cool research that's going in to try to understand that and try to reduce the biases that get introduced there and things like that. Uh, but for novices or intermediate, we don't have to worry as much about those things. But so in traditional machine learning, you'll be spending a bunch of time doing manual feature extraction. So this is, like I said, figuring out how important things like temperature are and uh, cleaning your data. And that can take a ton of time. And it also is valuable to have some domain expertise there. So if you're super well-versed in global climates, it might be easier for you to create a weather-based model than someone who knows nothing about that. Um, and then as well, you'll be trying out different classification algorithms and Initially, if you're just getting started with machine learning, you might just end up trying a bunch and seeing whichever works out best. And then as you move forward in your learning, you might be able to start to determine uh, the commonalities there, which model might work best for a certain data set, if it's numeric versus images, et cetera. But in the end, your result is the same. You get a prediction on whether or not it's a cat or a dog or something else. Now with deep learning, we'll have a neural network approach wherein we don't know exactly what's going on in this feature learning, but the uh, machine is actually learning on its own which aspects of the images are most important. Um, so often this comes down to the curves in the image or color profiles, et cetera. But like I said, in the end, you get that end result of a prediction. Um, and depending on what your problem looks like, either of these approaches might get you better accuracies. For image problems like we're dealing with today, deep learning often results in better accuracies. But if you're doing you know, financial modeling or things like that, traditional machine learning can often be sufficient. So within deep learning, there's a ton of different networks you can use. Um, today, we're going to be looking at what's called a convolutional neural network. This is a super, super popular network for specifically image recognition tasks. Um, and it looks kind of like this. There's a lot of animations in this slide. Um, so you start off by breaking down the image into RGB channels. And then from there, you'll apply uh, some transformations to start to figure out, the model will start to figure out the sort of edges and what, where the curves are in each image, et cetera. And then from there, and this is all at a high level, but <laughs> from there, you'll do some pooling 
And the pooling helps us reduce the amount of data we have to do computation over. So deep learning is a super, super computationally expensive task. Um, so unless you have a very high corporate card spending limit, you want to do some pooling here. Um, and then in the end, we'll get our fully connected network that can make our predictions. So to look back at the whole end-to-end -end machine learning workflow, these past few slides have been focusing on sort of the training aspect, but there's a ton of steps before and after that. Namely, at the beginning, we're going to be doing some data exploration. So this is where we'll get familiar with the data sets we're working with. So in this case, we're just working with one data set. But often, if you're doing this in your work or your hobby, you're going to be pulling from a bunch of different data sources. And so you want to get familiar with all of that data, see if you need to do any cleaning. So there might be a column that could be really useful, like age, but maybe half the values are missing for a bunch of the rows. So you'll have to do some work there to either generalize them or fill in those missing values, et cetera. So often a bunch of time gets spent in this data exploration phase just trying to understand and clean your data um, because data is truly the heart of both machine and deep learning. But once you've done that, you can get into the training step. And we can break the training down into three main pieces. Your training script, so this is what algorithm you're going to be applying as well as the compute. So if you're working with a small data set, you might be able to run it locally in a traditional machine learning algorithm. You could maybe do it quickly on your own machine. But when you get to big scale of data, you might need cluster computing, something like Spark or just a multiple GPU cluster or just a really powerful VM in the cloud. So this can be both local and remote. And then you may find you know, after you've created your, your training script on one pass on your compute, you're satisfied with the accuracy and you can move forward uh, to operationalizing it. But oftentimes you might want to do some additional tuning and that's what we'll be walking through today. Um, but once you've gotten a model you're satisfied with and you're happy with the accuracies you're seeing, you can get into productizing that uh, model. So this is when you're going to be maybe turning what you might start off with as a Jupyter notebook into a Python module and deploying that model to the cloud. And once you have a model deployed in the cloud, and in this case we're going to be deploying it as a web service, this could also be local, but anywhere publicly accessible, you can uh, submit your test images from your test application and start to see predictions come through. And then continue to scale this out depending on whatever your scenario requires. Um, so in this case, we'll be creating a web service and in the end, we'll be able to submit a picture of a dog uh, from our test application to this web service and receive back breed predictions. So let's start off and look at the data we're going to be working with. So the data set we're using is this Oxford Pet data set. This is a super popular data set. Uh, it's fun to work with because you just get to look at pictures of dogs and who doesn't like that. And it's got around 37 categories of pet breeds. It's a pretty well labeled data set and it's got a few hundred-ish images. It varies a bit by breed inside of each or for each breed. Um, I'll send, I'll give you the link to the slides after so don't worry too much about copying down these links or anything. And I also wanted to point you folks to this Azure Open data sets. If you're getting started with machine learning and want to try out different types of data, this is a resource we're investing in on the Microsoft side to publish an open source data sets for people to learn from and try out different machine learning techniques on. So I encourage you to check it out. Uh, there's only a few right now where we're continuing to invest it. And the more people who go there, the more things we'll publish, which makes me happy. Um, and it's all about me. <laughs> so when we're exploring our data, there's a ton of great tools we can use. Today, we're going to be using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, if you've haven't heard of them yet, we'll go through and show you one in more detail so you'll start to get familiar with them. But these are super useful for easy setup and quick experimentation. So you can try things out in a very visual manner. You can add in text alongside it so you can remember what you were doing and trace back through your experimentation workflow. And specifically, we just announced last month uh, Jupyter support inside of VS Code. This is really, really awesome. Um, we basically are bringing the power of VS Code, so things like sophisticated auto-completion, debugging, et cetera, to the world of notebooks. Um, and it comes with a bunch of goodness, like the remote development, ability to convert to a Python script, et cetera. 
rather than talk about it, um, I'm going to show you an example of what this looks like inside of Visual Studio Code. So this is a Jupyter notebook that I have uh, to train my model uh, using TensorFlow and Python. And this is all inside of Visual Studio. So we can see we can have our classic Jupyter commands like restarting the kernel, interrupting, running all our cells, etc. cetera. Um, and we also have a bunch of additional features on top of this, such as a variable explorer up here. Right now I'm not running anything, but once I do, uh, you can see the active variables and explore any data frames, filter them, et cetera. Um, and one really cool thing about this is, like I said, deep learning can be pretty compute intensive. So I'm actually not running this on my local machine. It's running, if you see this little SSH down here, I'm running on a remote machine in Azure that's GPU enabled. Um, so it's a really powerful machine, expensive, and can give me a lot more power than my local machine. But I can still access VS Code in the same way I'm used to. So we can start off by just exploring this data set, which is with the simple LS and seeing what our folder structure looks like. So we can see here the 37 different species names, and inside of those are each of the sets of images. And to see what that looks like visually, um, we have a plotting function over here, but this one's not running, so never mind. <laughs> but so yeah, we have our 37 images, or 37 folders of images. And now we can actually get into the training step of things. So like I said, we have around 200 images for each category, which may seem like a lot. But for something like deep learning, that's not really a sufficient amount of data. Um, and we'd likely end up with a poor model, either uh, over, oh, yeah. um, it'd either be overspecified or too inaccurate. So we're actually going to be using a technique called transfer learning. And what we're doing is taking a publicly available model called the mobile net model, which has been trained on thousands of images. But these are all just general images, things like cars, people, et cetera, just general objects. But with transfer learning, we're going to be retraining that last layer of our network specific to the 37 pet categories that we saw earlier. So I've had this running on my machine before. So we can see it took around 25 seconds. And uh, do, do, do. Ignoring all the warnings, we are able to get an accuracy of around 80%. So this is super impressive because if you look back just seven years ago uh, when this data set was first released, the best researchers with kind of unlimited compute time could only get to around 59% accuracy. So it's really impressive how much this field has advanced in just seven years. So in 26 seconds, we are able to get to 80% uh, accuracy. But I think we can do a bit better than that by exploring our hyperparameters. So hyperparameters are values you can set with your model uh, ahead of time. And we're going to be looking specifically at the learning rate. And you can think of the learning rate as sort of the size of the step you are going to take with each training uh, iteration you do. And to do this, we're going to be trying out a bunch of random values. So if you look here, we say that we're going to be trying uniform values between these two, uh, negative 15 and negative 3. And we're going to be doing 20 runs of this, four at a time. And the way we're going to be doing that is by using Azure Machine Learning Service. So I basically spun up a four-node cluster in Azure. And it's GPU machines, powerful machines. that, And for each of those machines, we're going to feed them a training job and a different learning rate. And then as we go through all of those runs, Azure Machine Learning is going to keep track of which one of those is seeing the best accuracy. So all I have to do is kind of feed it the same training script, set up a few things, and it'll go ahead and figure out the best learning rate for me. And of course, I could do you know, more total runs to try to find a better accuracy, et cetera. And I can show you what this looks like when it's running. So this is what Azure Machine Learning looks like in the Azure portal. And this is one of the runs I did recently. And as this goes, um, it'll show up once the Wi-Fi is better. But you can see a visualization, here we go, of all of our different runs. So these are the validation accuracies for each of the different learning rates we've tried out. So that's a visual cue. Um, and you can also see a few of these stop short. 
And the reason those stop short is because we added this smart thing here called a bandit policy. And we say that the slack factor is 0.15. And what that means is if we're seeing a run is more than 15% away from what our current best accuracy is, we're gonna go ahead and stop that early so we can free up that compute resource to try out a new learning rate that might get us a better accuracy because it's probably not worth wait, wasting the compute time on something that likely isn't gonna turn into our best accuracy. So this takes around 30 minutes to run. So rather than uh, doing that, I'm actually gonna use an existing run I've done of this. So I've read what's called register this with the Azure Machine Learning Service. And I can click to see the details of this uh, run in the Azure portal. But so this was one I did last week, I think. And we can see we got an accuracy of around 90%. And I've registered this with the Azure Machine Learning Service, which means that uh, me or anyone on my team who has access to this can create images from that model or deploy a web service from that model, uh, all from within this portal view or from within Visual Studio Code. So that's a high level view of how we can get an initial model inside of Visual Studio Code. But I know we went through a lot, so let's walk back through some slides uh, about what we just did. So that was the training step uh, in the data exploration of our workflow. And like I said, we were doing some deep learning with small data sets. And by nature, deep learning is going to retire, require a ton of compute and a ton of time. Um, but since you know, we only had a small amount of data, it's not really going to be enough. And there's a couple solutions we could do here. You know, we could try to get more data. So though that'd be my dream job to just go around taking photos of dogs, <laughs> probably not realistic in this case. So instead, we're going to use transfer learning. And transfer learning allows us to use a pre-trained model um, that someone else spent the time and resources to train and retrain it specific to our data set. So this can be super powerful um, to get really accurate models with that smaller amount of data. And after we got our initial model using transfer learning, so that was when we got to around 80%, we did some hyperparameter tuning. And the way we did that hyperparameter tuning was with the Azure Machine Learning Service. And the Azure Machine Learning Service, one, does what we showed, which was uh, making it easy to do hyperparameter tuning by distributing our work for us. So it was able to take what we would normally have to run on one machine and spread it across four or however many nodes you want to pay for super easily. But it also manages your compute for you. So for instance, it will auto scale down your cluster. So obviously, I don't want to be paying for four GPUs all the time. Um, so it'll auto terminate if it's not seeing any activity or scale down. Um, and it also, one useful thing I love a lot is their automated machine learning. So this essentially lets you point uh, AML at a data set. And it'll go ahead and try out a bunch of different common models, like a regression or a boosted tree, et cetera over your data and then tell you which one gets the best accuracy. So this is similar to what we did with learning rates and hyperparameters, uh, but even more simple and straightforward. And you can even just do it with a click through, no code experience. Um, but yeah, so AML offers sort of an end-to-end -end suite of things around your machine learning lifecycle. So I encourage you to try it both if you're in an enterprise scenario where you need a lot of ML ops and things like that, as well as if you're starting out and want to try out a more visual interface or automated machine learning, they have a ton of resources for that as well. So now that we have this model and we're fairly satisfied with it, often the next step is going to be operationalizing it. So right now, all we have is this Jupyter notebook. And like we saw, it's super useful if, you know, if I wanted to show you all in a presentation or show a coworker that Jupyter notebook that has all the text, has the visualizations right there in line, is really easy to present or tell a story around your work. But if we want to productize this and make it reusable, we might want to build a Python module. And Visual Studio Code has a couple helpful things to do this. So we have this button up here that says convert to Python script. So when we click this, we will essentially uh, take that notebook we just saw and create a Python file that looks like this. And this will have cells in line um, that will allow you to run all of the same code you just saw in your notebook. But we've taken the markdown and converted it to 
uh, Python comments and broken things up into individual cells. And um, so this is all the same code we've seen, but just as a Python module or a Python file. And here we can get all of the good refactoring goodness that you you uh, expect in VS Code. So for instance, we could extract a method from this and it would automatically pull out a function here. Or we could, you know, rename symbols, et cetera. So we built this experience because we saw a lot of folks, we saw a lot of data scientists who would put their Jupyter notebook side by side with their editor and just copy paste code in between the two, which is super needless effort that we can do very easily. Um, and so rather than refactoring this all in front of you, I can show you what this would look like. So we have all of our imports moved to the top. We've created a few different functions and we have this reusable. So for instance, that cell that we had that did our transfer learning, now we've created a function from it that we can call repeatedly. Um, same thing with our hyperparameter tuning. And so now we have this reusable module that's super useful for more uh, repeatable scenarios. And once we have uh, this completed module, we can see here, um, so we also have this interactive window experience in VS Code. So what I just showed you was a Jupyter notebook converted into a Python module. And normally you'd see these little code lenses here where you can run the cell and it would pull out side by side um, this interactive window, which gives you those same visualizations you were seeing in line with Jupyter side by side with your code. Um, and this you can do things like debugging with as well, or one thing I like to use a lot is VS Live Share. So that basically, I can click a button and it generates a link that I can send to a coworker or colleague and they can then view the same Visual Studio Code window as me and either we can pair program or pair debug, etc. And this is supported with the same remote capabilities you were seeing as well. And you could always move back from this uh, interactive window, you could export that out to a Jupyter notebook as well. And it also has the variable explorer and data viewer we are seeing. So now that we've got this Python module and we have our model ready, we can go ahead and deploy. So since I already am using Azure Machine Learning and I've registered that model, uh, I've actually installed a Visual Studio Code extension for uh, Azure Machine Learning. And I don't know why the Wi-Fi is cutting out on me. Um, but if this doesn't load, so essentially you would see all the machine learning workspaces uh, along uh, side of your VS Code code. And from there, we could just right click on our model. So we registered the model as just KCAMF, because uh, that's my alias. And I can just right click and point it at just my environment configuration. So we have just a couple things, and this makes sure that when we deploy our model, it will run with the exact same environment configuration we expect and that we've tested with, as well as our scoring script. So this scoring script is what's gonna run when an image gets sent to our model, um, or an, actually a JSON form of an image gets sent to our model, and it'll essentially uh, run some TensorFlow code to score it and send back the predictions. And all I need to do is feed AML those two files and it'll automatically deploy a containerized version of our model and provide you a super easy URL that you can then access for testing purposes. And one thing I've also done is use the VS Code remote. Uh, as I mentioned, we're doing it to a data science virtual machine right now. But in theory, you could also SSH to your production deployment and run some tests in that environment to make sure all of your environment configurations, et cetera, are running properly before you fully deploy something or make it publicly available. And so it takes around eight or so minutes to deploy, but I've already got a deployed version of this model up here. So I can, ah, oh, this is the run cell that we weren't seeing earlier because the Wi-Fi is struggling for me. It may not come up with a thing, so this may be fairly anticlimactic. Is there a better Wi-Fi I should be on? 
<laughs> okay. not, yes. <laughs> Maybe I'll try. <laughs> yeah, see if we can get that one. I know. This one? Yeah. Those are all That's okay. You would think our corporate Wi Fi would work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Reconnecting. I know it's the upgraded. That's the upgraded one. We love upgrades. <laughs> okay. Well, when this when and if this reconnects, <laughs> you will see that we have this really cute image of a Samoyed smiley pup, and we send it to our web service and we get back predictions. <laughs> And they're super accurate, obviously, because I'm demoing it to you, and it's amazing. <laughs> uh, okay. Trust me. <laughs> uh, well, I'll send you the links to the GitHub repository so you can deploy your own web service and try it out on your own. Um, but let's just pretend like everything worked. And I'll go back once we're done with the slides to see if it's reconnected and being nice to me. Uh, but, okay, so this is what it would have looked like had the Wi-Fi worked, <laughs> where we have all of our Azure machine learning resources right here. So I have my models, and I could just, this is where I'd right-click and hit deploy, and everything would be great. Um, and so I can just easily deploy a web service right from within VS Code. Um, and you can also submit experiments. So what we were doing earlier when I showed you that view the pretty graph of all of our runs. That's an experiment in Azure Machine Learning. So we could have also uh, submitted that directly from the VS Code extension, as well as manage things, view things, et cetera, all that you'd expect. Um, so to review what we've done today, I searched proud dog on Google, and this is what I got. <laughs> I was very satisfied with it. So we are able to explore data and train a model within uh, using Jupyter within VS Code. And then from there, we used Azure Machine Learning to tune that model. So we had the model that we just ran on the DSVM uh, to get 80% accuracy, and then we configured our hyperparameters, tried out a bunch of different learning rates to figure out which learning rate was the best to uh, further tune our model. Then we got up to 90% accuracy. And then we took that notebook, that sort of experimental artifact, and turned it into a reusable Python module using some of those VS Code refactoring capabilities to just directly convert the IPYMB into a .py file and extract some modules, clean up our code, uh, reorder our imports, et cetera. And then from there, we deployed a web service uh, and then tested it and saw that we got great results. <laughs> <laughs> So for you folks, what's next? You could build your own pet detector. So this is the GitHub repository. And try out the VS Code Jupyter support today. So this is a super easy way to get started with Jupyter and VS Code. Uh, all you need is the Python extension. So if you have VS Code, you go to the little extensions tab and install the Python extension. And it'll automatically handle the Jupyter installation, et cetera. So just need the Python extension, it's the Microsoft one, straightforward. And it's all explained at that link. Um, and then a few additional resources, so the slides are up at that link, the GitHub is the same link that you just saw, some of these are also the same links, but they're good links. Um, and then we also are outside for the next three days, our booth is like literally right in front of this door, so you can come talk to us, we are a resource as well, or hit me up on email or Twitter, or yeah, the, all the Microsoft people who will be at our booth. And I'll be around for questions as well. And let's check. Did it come back? <laughs> no. OK, cool. But <laughs> there's videos of me doing this talk online. You can watch them. <laughs> Thanks very much for the walkthrough. Um, is VS Code running like its own version of Jupyter on the back end, or is it using your like local download? Oh, 
Okay. Um, to to do it. So like if Jupiter updates its version and there's a bunch of new features, um, do you have to go get a new version of VS Code or will that automatically load in since it's using like your backend installation? So we use your uh, local version, Jeffrey, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, we connect to your Jupyter and we also have support for, oh, sorry. Microphones. Uh, yeah, so we use your local Jupyter installation, and then we also have some support for connecting to a remote Jupyter servers as well. Um, so it's kind of bring your own Jupyter. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, like I said, we'll all be around all week. Thank you all.